Hi guys, welcome to another Elvistory video. So as you guys probably already know, this is another reaction video. And the video I will be doing this time is uh, from the video called Elvis uh, Up Close and Personal with Sonny West. Now, for some of you that don't know who Sonny West was, whether you're a new fan, whether you're a very young fan, Sonny West was a bodyguard for Elvis Presley from 1960 to about 1976. And also, obviously, he was in the Memphis Mafia. So now, this video um, has always been like uh, one of my personal favorites that I've, I've seen once before a long time ago. And I just, I, I came across it again. I thought it would be something really uh, good to have on this channel and to be able to do a reaction to because uh, Sonny tells a lot of very nice stories of Elvis, Elvis's uh, generosity, his, um, his compassion for other people. And also Sonny tells a lot of uh, funny stories as well. It's just all in all. It's just a very good experience of the stories that he shares about Elvis now uh, For a long time um, There was a lot of you know negative uh, Vibes towards Sonny and his cousin Red West for the book that they put out in 1977 uh, called um, Elvis what happened now, to me personally, uh, I like to give people a chance. I like to do research on them, figure out really who they are and whether they're actually really uh, bad people or if they're, you know, just getting, you know, if that was just one thing that was bad that happened, but they actually are really good people. It turns out, in my opinion, after watching several interviews with Sonny West, that you know, he was, he's actually a pretty good guy. And I don't, like him and uh, Red and Elvis, they shared, well, Sonny was with Elvis for about uh, 16 years. Red was with Elvis for about uh, over 20 years. So, you know, I don't, the way I look at it, and this is just my personal opinion, you're entitled to have yours, whether if you if you don't like Sonny, that's fine. I, I don't hold it against you. We're all allowed to have our own opinions. But for me personally, I don't let, uh, out of 15, 20 years, I don't let one uh, moment in time define the whole relationship that those guys had with one another. Because, you know, uh, they were close like brothers. And sometimes brothers have fallouts and they say things at a hurt would do things at a hurt that they normally wouldn't do and I think this was one of those instances uh, I think Sonny and Red were uh, just a little too I'll put it this way they, at that point they took things into their own into their own hands concerning Elvis and his uh, medications to try and help him and they basically crossed that line that you don't with Elvis, you know, they, but they, the way they did it was, uh, in a way because that they cared about him because, uh, they just didn't see, want to see him self-destruct. And that was, uh, my opinion of, of why, you know, they were let go. I mean, we all have our own opinions, but in my opinion that was the main thing why they were let go and so naturally they were hurt about that because deep down inside they like I said these guys all loved each other a lot all of them not just Sonny and Red you know Marty uh, Billy uh, Jerry they all they were all like a brotherhood man that's really how it was and I don't let one little not that it was a little thing but I don't let one point in time define uh, 15, 20 years of good, solid friendship. So now, uh, Sonny was actually in a couple of Elvis's, uh, movies. 
I think uh, Stay Away Joe, Kid Galahad, uh, and Elvis was actually um, the best man at Sonny's wedding in 1970. Uh, Sonny married uh, Judy Jordan, who was on the Jackie Gleason show, Away We Go. He met her, and uh, Elvis was the best man, and Priscilla was the maid of honor. Now, uh, Sonny passed away, in, unfortunately, uh, from cancer tw uh, in the year 2017. But um, he, he had two children, uh, Alana, a daughter, Alana, and uh, a son, Brian. I think he had one grandson, Tristan, at the time when he passed away. But uh, Sonny stayed married to uh, Judy for approximately 47 years, so... So anyway, um, like I said, this video is a nice video in a way that, you know, it tells really nice, funny stories and really compassionate stories about Elvis's, you know, generosity and stuff like that. So I really think you guys are going to enjoy this. Um, and like I said, if you have a negative opinion about Sonny, that's fine. If you don't want to watch the video, that's fine too. But if you want to give Sonny a chance, you know, if you're that type of person that believes in giving people chances to tell more or less, well, not that side, that's not what this video is about. It's about just seeing who actually Sonny is and how he really does love Elvis. So, you know, if you want to just give this video a chance, I would appreciate that. If not, that's okay too. And so without any further ado, <laughs> um, all right, guys, we'll get to, uh, this is, this video is part one of a two part video that I'm doing. So, uh, maybe in a couple of days, I'll have part two uploaded to this channel as well. So, like I said, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy, um, this video called Elvis up close and personal with Sonny West. Naturally, you know, I'll be stopping here and there to give my opinions or state some facts here and there. Um, but anyway, go get your snacks, go get, you know, your favorite blanket, whatever you curl up, relax and enjoy the video. And I will see you guys there in a couple of seconds. Okay guys, so this is, uh, once again, this is Elvis Up Close and Personal with Sonny West, uh, Elvis Presley's former bodyguard. Um, this was filmed in the year 2008. I'm not too sure about the location though. So, okay, Sonny, take it away. We are in there. Nice to meet you. This is my nice daughter, Lana. Hi. Okay, thanks. Hey. This is my son-in-law, Greg. Greg. <laughs> He's gonna take a picture there. All right, come on in here, honey, on this side, Mom. Oh, okay. Oh. Judy, come on in. <laughs> come on over here. Now, left to right, guys. Um, this is Sonny's family. Uh, that's from the immediate left. That's uh, Sonny's wife, uh, Judy, who he married in 1970, where Elvis was the best man. Uh, next to his wife Judy is his daughter Alana, and next to Sonny too, uh, well last on the right would be Sonny's uh, son-in-law Greg. Now uh, Sonny also had a son named Brian and a grandson named Tristan. Here we go. One, two, three. There we go. All right. Good. Great. I've got I can't your, mind. Oh, you did? We got mm -hmm. this one. We'll get some copies made up. Yeah, you have to. I can't believe we got it. I don't want it too tight, but I don't want to right. pull the tabs up. Looking good. All right. Stick this mm -hmm. inside. There we go. There you go. First one he gave out. I was with him when he picked them up. He ordered 12 of them after he designed them with the Priscilla and with the uh, jeweler. That's the TCB necklace, guys, in case you can't see it. I know it's a little hard to see what he's holding, but that's the TCB necklace that Elvis gave him. 
And we went over there when they were ready to pick him up, and I was the only one with him. He put this on my neck right there in the jewelry store, and then uh, put one on his neck. And we left, took the other ten up, and he started handing them out up at the house. Taking care of business, lightning fast. That was <laughs> the motto. All right. Let's rock and roll. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming here, and uh, we got in with the good weather, so now when the bad weather, we'll have to ask for it to go down while we go to lunch, and then it can, when you're home, it can start back raining again, right? That's what we've been asking for. Anyway, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy it. I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of stories of my life with Elvis. I hope to give you an insight into him beyond what you already have from the books and the movies and documentaries you've seen uh, a lot of that was not done by some of us that were really personally close to him and uh, so I want to tell you that I want to first thing I want to do is tell you about when I met him I met him in 1958 just before he was getting ready to go to Germany and uh, I was home from the Air Force I'd gotten out and was home and my cousin Red uh, took me out to and my three sisters and my brother-in-law out to the skating rink to, uh, for Elvis's private roller skating party that he was having. He had a lot of them, which I was to find out, much to my chagrin. But anyway, I'd like to first tell you, to kind of give you a theme of what he was beyond what you saw. That was when I first met him. I first saw him when I was in high school. He came to the campus and he was promoting his record, new one, That's All Right Mama, which was recorded on my birthday in 1954, July the 5th. Oh, wow. And so that fall, I'm in school, go out at lunchtime, and there he is on the campus and he's singing these songs that he, that he had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought at the time, he moved around a lot, but he was good, you know. He, even then, he was jumping around all over the place. Girls were giggling and laughing. And, <laughs> Oh, yeah, isn't he handsome, this and that, so. Uh, then the next time I saw him was I was in the Air Force and he did a concert show out in Tucson, Arizona, where I was stationed at the base out there. And I went and saw him there and Dynamite, Dynamite, he was in 56. And then the next time I saw him probably will stick out. In fact, I know it will stick out in my life forever. Red's father, my Uncle Tom, who was my favorite uncle, passed away. He actually passed away the same day that Elvis's mother passed away. Oh, wow. Just, she passed away early in the morning around 5.30 a.m. or so, and later that evening, going into that day and that evening, Red's father died. Mm -hmm. So it made their funerals a day apart. But it's kind of ironic because they were buried one day apart, but they were in the same funeral home, the services, and also the same exact stateroom. Wow. And I was sitting there with my dad in the family area, and Red's up there on the front row, and we hear this noise behind us, and we turn around and look, and there's a private entrance that comes in from the street. And here comes Elvis with a couple of guys with him. And he's just kind of stumbling along. And he's calling out to Red. Red, where, where are you, man? Red. Because you got to understand, he had just buried his mother the day before. Mm -hmm. And he came in, and Red stood up, and they embraced. And Elvis was crying very, very openly. They walked over to the casket, and he said, oh, Red, I know how much you love him. I know how much you miss him. And he said, uh, Mama was just there yesterday, so I know what you're going through. And uh, they hugged, and then Elvis said, you know what, Red, I'll, I'll be there for you, man. Come out to the house when you're ready, but I gotta get out of here. There were a lot of people were crying watching it. That's the most emotion I ever saw of Elvis in the rest of the years. I saw some other trying times for him, even when we went out to, to visit his mom's gravesite, 
there in the early 60s. When we would drive out there quite often and go up there and he'd just talk to his mom while we kind of stood off to the back, whoever was with him. But that was his humanity. That's the Elvis that you won't, you won't see. You won't ever see because he's gone. But that's the Elvis that was there that no one else saw except us guys. And uh, his humanity really really was something that stuck out in so many ways and that's one of them he was that's that's when he showed how human he really was you know he was there for red right. even though he just lost his mom so uh and how difficult must it have been for elvis i mean just the day before uh was his mother's wake and being the kind of person he was you know knowing that red's father passed away uh, he made it a point to go back to the funeral home, even though, you know, he had just uh, gone through everything with his mother the day before in her wake. And it just shows you, it just shows you the level of compassion that Elvis had, you know, for, you know, his friends and his family. It's just, you know, that's just the kind of person he was, man. Now, after that, uh, he went back to the base and he came back on leave before he went to Germany to spend 18 months over there and uh, Red invited myself and and my three sisters and uh, my brother-in-law to come out there to meet him to a private party he was having he had a lot of them at the roller skating rink we went out there uh, Red brings Elvis over they skate up and everything and I'm, I'm not a very good skater I didn't spend much time skating when I was younger you know uh, mm. other things were more fun but uh, they come over and introduce, and I, I was very impressed at how nice Elvis was. I mean, this is a superstar. And he said, hey, Sonny, nice to meet you, and, and everything, and nice to meet you. And I'm thinking, whoa, you know. My brother-in-law's in the Air Force, and he's home on leave. And he's, uh, so we're standing there, and they said, uh, look, we play a game here called War. And we'd like y'all to, to play with it, but we want you to see how we play it first and then you'll know how we play it and then you can join in after we take the first break and we said okay well they went out there and I'll tell you war is a good word for it it's chaotic <laughs> bodies flying all over the place it's a combination of hockey rugby football everything wrestling judo karate you just don't hit in the face and I'm seeing bodies fly through the air and I'm seeing them get body blocked and flipping over and hitting on that floor and I you know, when my brother, <laughs> my brother-in-law walks away, <laughs> he said, I'm not going out there. And he went back up there and sat next to my sister. And so uh, I had noticed a box, big cardboard box over to the side where people were getting out elbow pads and putting on their elbows and putting on their knees. And uh, I'd already done that because I knew I was going to fall out there when I tried to skate. So Red and them, they take the break and they come over and... Uh, First thing, Rich, where's Bill, my brother-in-law? I said, he's back up with Barbara, my sister up there, <laughs> sitting down. And Red hollered, and Bill, come on. Bill said, I can't get out there, man. I got a family to raise, you know. <laughs> he was only 28 or 29. He was about five or six years older than us at all, but he acted like he was an old man. So Red looked at me and said, what about you, Sonny? I said, let's go, but I'm going to go over that box first. I went over that box, boy, and I put pads on from up here. I look like a goalie in a hockey league without the mask. And I asked him, you got any chest protectors or anything around here? And I loaded up from the top of my knees down to my ankles, all the way to my hands up. And I said, I'm ready. Well, I went out there. I, of course, new guy on the block. I'm on the other team. So I go down there and I get over next to the rail. Because, I, like I said, I don't skate good. And I need that rail if I start to fall to grab hold of. So I'm there and I look up. There's a girl on Elvis's team, and she's on the side of the rail that I am, up there on his side. And she was the only girl that he would let skate, because she was tough. She looked more like a Chicago linebacker, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, uh-oh. Sure enough, they blow the whistle, and I start trying to get going. And the others just leave me, and then all of a sudden, here comes this freight train at me. <laughs> Whoa, and I put my hands up just to try to absorb getting the blow I'm getting ready to get, and it knocked me spinning, and I went down. Now, man, you know, what a hit. So I get up, don't think anything about it, 
And I start looking for someone to do it again. All of a sudden, I just get going and something grabs me by my shirt and jerks me backward. My feet go out and I hit that floor and she goes skating by. You know. <laughs> so I got up next time. I started looking for her. I'm looking around because I think she was like a shark <laughs> circling, you know, waiting for me. And I didn't know why at the time. I didn't know what it was. Hmm. And so I didn't see her. So I got up again and I started moving on. And I see someone and I start going and all of a sudden something hit me behind my knees and my legs went up. And I hit the floor and she goes skating by again. I said, enough, enough. I crawled over to the side, afraid to get up, afraid she'd get me before I got there. I crawled over and got against the rail and just leaned back against the rail that's around the rink. And they just kept, I'm watching bodies flying, I'm ducking, and some of them go by. And then they blew the whistle and took a break. Here comes Red and Elwood. Red, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm resting. He said, resting? I said, yeah, all I've done is get up and down off that floor. That girl was just beating the hell out of me over there. <laughs> Elwood's laughing. He said, Melinda, come here. So she skates over and he says, why are you after him? That's Red's cousin. And she liked Red because Red was as physical as she was, you know, boom, busting heads. So she said, I don't care who he is. She said, if he's going to knock me down, I'm going to knock. I said, honey, I'm not trying to knock you down. I'm trying to get out of your way. <laughs> you know, and I said, as a matter of fact, if you'll leave me alone and I happen to end up in front of you, just give me a minute to turn and I'll just go the other way. <laughs> so Elvis is dying laughing. So he said, Melinda, leave him alone. You know, he, he's, mm. he's OK. So we went ahead and skated and everything. And uh, end of the night there, I went up and I had a split cheek. Elvis even had a first aid guy that does the butterfly stitches in case you get a cut. So I had a cut. He put that. I had a cut in my head where skates almost knocked me out, hit me in the head and cut my head. My shoulder, I got knocked into the rail one time because I was hanging close to it, and I bruised it up real bad. So I go up to Elvis after it's all over with, and I thank him for having me and my sisters out there and, and tell him, you know, that I really enjoyed meeting you and everything. He said, yeah, a lot of fun, right? And I said, uh, yeah, I had some fun, you know. He said, well, I'll see you tomorrow night then. I said, Elvis, tomorrow night I probably won't even be able to walk, much less skate. He said, well, maybe not, but you'll be out here skating, won't you? I didn't know it, folks, but at that time, that was the seed was planted. Not only for a friendship that would endure and get bigger and, and everything and grow over the years, starting a year and a half when he got back in the Army, but also I'd be doing his bidding. I'd be doing what he needed done. When he asked me to go to work, he let me know that. So he went to Germany. And then he comes home. Oh, one thing, too. Back then, I said GD a lot. I mean, like every other word, as soon as I'd say it. And uh, Red told me, said, man, Sonny, Elvis really likes you, but you really say GD, and he doesn't like that word. I said, well, I'll stop saying it, you know, and I did. Later on, Elvis said it quite a bit. But anyway, <laughs> later on through the years when he got mad. But uh, so he came back. And I went out to see him, say hi to him, welcome him home. And the war started again, back out to the skating rink. But we had breaks where we went and watched movies all night, too. And I hung out with him. And I was still doing my day job, working from 8 to 5 over at this appliance store. I repaired washer, dryers, and uh, at Ace Appliance. And so after about two or three weeks, and Elvis asked me if I'd ever heard of karate. Back when I walked in to see him, there he was, uh, in the, he was in the foyer, right there, doing karate with his friend that had studied with him in the Army. And he asked me if I'd ever heard of it. And I said, no, but I've seen those outfits because I'd seen judo. And they had on the, the gis. And he said, yeah, he said, this is the, uh, it's called the gi. So anyway, getting back to it, so when I uh, started hanging out with him, he went ahead and, and uh, asked if I'd like to go to work for him. I said, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just, everyone just got quiet. Uh, I said, uh, well, what would I do? And he said, well, whatever I need. What I, whatever I need you to do, drive, go get something, you know, run errands or whatever. I said, okay, I'll have to give my notice uh, 
two weeks notice from my boss. He said, that's okay. He said, we're getting ready to go down to uh, Florida where I'm doing a TV show with Frank Sinatra, which it was that Timex special welcome back Elvis yeah. thing or whatever. And he said, then when we come back, we're going to go to Nashville, record a couple of songs, then we're going to head out and make a movie. And for some of you guys, what he's talking about, if you remember, um, right after Elvis got home, he went to uh, Florida to uh, film the uh, Welcome Home special that Frank Sinatra put, him on, uh, put on. It was the Timex uh, Welcome Home uh, Elvis show. And uh, I think Sammy Davis Jr. was there and... Uh, Frank's daughter Nancy, and so that's what uh, Sonny's referencing. I said, I'll be ready to go. So I was. He went on down, did the special, got $125,000 back in 1960 for singing two and a half songs. Not bad, huh? Unheard of, but that's Not what Colonel all. could do. He, could, he knew how to make those deals. So uh, we head out, go out on a train, actually private train we have a club car and a sleeper and uh, we're sitting in the club car there on the ride it took about two and a half three days to get out there and we're visiting in there and, all, and I always wore a flat top when I was younger it was a very popular haircut back then you either wore long with the DA's or you had a half and half which was flat top on the back with the DA's on the side well I just kept my I played baseball football so I just kept my hair short and that was looking at me he said Sonny that hair is not going to cut it out in Hollywood, man. I said, what do you mean? He said, you got to let that moss grow. <laughs> he said, get that Tony Curtis look, you know, sweep it over and everything. I thought, you do? I said, okay. I didn't know. I was 21 years old. Other than being in the Air Force, I hadn't been anywhere big time. So I started doing it. And I've got a picture, as a matter of fact, taken on Wild in the Country where my hair is starting to, it's growing that way. <laughs> So uh, we got out there and we went over to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, same hotel where they shot Pretty Woman, if you remember that movie. Oh, wow. And Lamar and Charlie and I are staying up in the penthouse, which the word, it's a big word, nice sounding word, but it's just a big room with two studio beds and we had to bring in a fold away for, for Charlie. And Elvis had a two room suite where Joe and his cousin Gene stayed in one bedroom and Elvis had the back bedroom. So we're going to go over and to the set to Paramount to start filming GI Blues. They'd already shot some second unit stuff in Germany while Elvis was actually over there. They did some sh tank shots with a double and everything. Mm. So uh, we're crazy, we're young, and we're going to have some fun. Well, we pull pranks on each other all the time. And we pulled one on Elvis because his co-star was Juliet Prowse who was engaged to Frank Sinatra at the mm -hmm. time, the chairman of the board, right? So Elvis warmed her up. She was kind of aloof when they first started, and he, but his charm, I mean, he had the charm. He warmed her up. Pretty soon she was all over him, you know? But anyway, uh, Red one day were sitting there, and there they have a portable dressing room that they roll over to the sound stages because all the stars have a permanent dressing room there on the lot. But they use these ones on rollers that they take a, Tow, little tow truck and they bring them to the different sound stages. All it is is it's on wheel, it's got the door, you step up to it and it's got a couch here, it's got a closet there for hanging wardrobe and it's got the mirror here for the makeup and everything. So their door is closed, we're out there and Red knocked on that door and said, Elvis, here comes Frank. <laughs> Boy, about two minutes that door went, hey, where? You know, and Red, I just kidding. He said, Red, don't do that again. I'll get you, man. Don't do that again. So we did it again. A couple of more times. <laughs> he ends up chasing us around the studio. <laughs> then one day, here comes Frank. Oh. Remember the old cry wolf story? <laughs> well, I wasn't crying wolf. I knocked that door. Because it, it was at lunchtime, and the soundstage doors are real big. So where they bring the equipment, and they just roll them open and let the the stage air out for that morning shoot, what all was going on with the dust and everything. And there's that silhouette with that little pork pie hat and that little suit and those little dap. And I thought, oh man, here comes Frank Elvis. Him and Juliet are in there. Get away from that door. I said, Elvis, I'm not kidding you. I'm keeping my voice now because I don't want him to hear me <laughs> telling him that here he comes. Uh, 
I knocked. I was, I'm not kidding. It's Sonny. Open the door, man. You better get away from that door. Okay. Here he comes. He comes up. Hey, fellas, how y'all doing? Hi, Miss Sinatra. How you doing? Yes, sir. We're doing good. He said, "We all seen uh, Juliet?" And I said, uh, "Yes, sir. She's they're here going over their lines right there." And Elvis and Juliet, probably Juliet said, "That's Frank." So real quick, that door opened. Elvis said, "Well, hello, Frank. Like you just now seen him, you know, because I didn't get a chance to knock." And uh, so he said, "See what happens, guys." With cry wolf, and we looked at him. So was anything going on? He said, "No, your damn business." <laughs> just don't cry wolf anymore, you know. <laughs> so that's that's the way that uh, it did. And then another thing we did, another thing was a, was a water fight we had. Start off, got these pistols, little water pistols that you could buy back at the drugstore, toy store, and we're shooting each other everywhere. The crew's getting in on it. They're stealing our guns when we set them down so they can shoot us, and it's it's going along. But by the time we got back to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Now we've graduated to buckets of water, <laughs> waste baskets, filling them up. Boom. Sweet got wet, hallway got wet, and then Red, we jumped Elvis and pinned him down. I grabbed his legs and I was holding on to his legs. Joe Esposito was around his waist having his arms pinned, and Red's up there doing something I didn't know or I wouldn't have been in on it taking his hand and rubbing Elvis's nose. Elvis had an extremely sensitive nose. And he's rubbing that thing hard. And that was a cussing. Girl, man, let me go. And I can feel that body. I think we're getting ready. He's going to get loose. And about the time, Red said, let's go. Well, he jumped up, went that way, and I jumped up, let go of the legs, and I got out. He caught Joe. <laughs> Joe tried to get he Pulled him down, boy. Pound. Started pounding on Joe. Joe's trying to roll away from him. He's kicking him, you know. <laughs> Not, not to really hurt him, but he's kicking, calling him names. You were part of it, this and that. He gets a guitar and he, he hits Joe with, hits his elbow. And that, Joe, ow, that gum, that hurt him. I don't care. And he tried to hit him again. Then he comes looking for Red now. We're smart. We're out in the hallway where we can move on if we need to. He comes out that door and he sees this boy. He takes a guitar and slings it at us. And that thing comes sailing through. And about that time, they had permanent guests in that hotel. And this guy heard this ruckus, and he opened the little old guy, opened that door, and that guitar went whoosh, right by <laughs> He looked down there, and he slammed that door and went back inside. And, and a few minutes later, the phone rang, assistant manager, what's going on up there? Uh, what, 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 what do you mean? The, Mr. So-and-so across the hallway said that y'all out there throwing guitars and everything else in the hallway. I said, not us. <laughs> well, we were asked to move. <laughs> So he was kicked out of Knickerbocker, too, in the 50s, so it wasn't nothing new. He didn't really trash him, but we did get the carpet wet and things like that. But uh, it was, uh, I'd like to regress here, if I could, while we're talking about this movie that I was first with him on. In 1956, he went out to make a movie called Love Me Tender. It's a very sweet story about his mom. And uh, in the movie, you know, all know that if seen Elvis died up on that mountain. And so when they saw the preview of it, and his mom and dad were there with him, and they were watching at Fox at a studio they had there, and she started crying. Uh. You shouldn't have died. He said, Mom, I didn't. That's just a part. She said, no, no. That boy in that picture shouldn't have died. He was such a sweet boy. Tom had help his character, you know. So he said, well, Mom, that's just the way they make movies out here. So they left. Now the studio sends out sneak previews along with comment cards about what you think of the movie, what you like, what you didn't like, this and that. About 90% of them came back, loved the movie, this, Elvis shouldn't have died. <laughs> studio said, we got a problem. Mm. Got a major star here that we're getting ready to break. Got a good movie. And they don't like it, the ending. And you know how Hollywood is, that ending. Back then, you got to have that great ending with... The, Curtain blowing, music playing, and everything's just going to be wonderful. So they brought Elvis back, and they shot a new ending. Because, see, at that time, during that movie, he died on that mountain. That was it. That's, that's the last thing you saw of him, his character. They brought him back, and they superimposed him big on the screen, playing the guitar, with that sweet smile on his face, and he's kind of looking over the ranch like he's up in heaven. Now, they actually... 
um, in Love Made Tender, um, they actually uh, filmed a new scene where Elvis lived in the end, but um, they got turned down by, I think, I don't know, I guess the executives or somebody turned it down. Only, I think, the producers know why, but they did shoot an ending where, uh, where Elvis actually lived, but instead, like Sonny said, they chose to go with uh, an ending where Elvis is singing Love Me Tender and like a ghostly images of him is on the screen singing it as his family walks away. And he's looking out for everyone he loves down there. That was great. Fans loved it. They accepted it. So it went out and got good reviews and everything. But that, uh, his mom was right on, you know, because a lot of other people said he shouldn't have died. Because if y'all remember, he was such a, an innocent young kid on that thing. The character he played is just someone that you, you don't want someone like that to die. So he didn't, you know. Well, he did, but he didn't. <laughs> but uh, also, uh, out there on that movie, before, oh, by the way, two movies that Elvis died in. Star. Both of them were at Fox, and both of them were Westerns. He died in Love Me Tender, and he died also in the movie Flaming Star, which I'll tell you about right now, because before the movie started, we had to go out there for him to pick out the horse that he wanted to ride in the movie. They got about six or seven horses there for him to choose from, and uh, the wrang two wranglers there. So Elvis goes over and he picks out this big horse, big red. He says, yeah, I like, I like the looks of him. How about him? So they tightened the saddle up. Elvis got up on him. Him and the head wrangler took off and went out. This is on 20th Century Fox, which is now Century City. But it used to be a huge back lot there with western towns and country homes and all kind of scary houses. They just, you know, where they shot these movies. Mm. So they take off and we're... Us guys, three or four of us sitting there, we're thinking, boy, we'd like to get on that horse, those other horses, and go out there and ride with them, you know? So we're just kind of sitting there, and all of a sudden we hear there's ruckus. Whoa, you son of a whoa! And we look, and here comes Elvis, and that horse is running away with him. <laughs> Elvis, his legs are flopping out, he's hanging on to that thing, man, that horn. And I'm thinking, uh oh, uh oh, and it, it's scary. It was funny later, like we're doing now, but at the time it was scary. And there's like a little gate that comes in where they load the stock in. And I thought, that horse not going to make that gate, man. That was going to get thrown. And I'm really, my, I'm scared for him. And that horse comes to that gate because he wants to come back to where he was. And as he makes that turn, those back legs spread out, Elvis hangs on, goes way over here on this side, and that horse gets them together, and he goes back on this side. It's almost like slow motion. And then he runs in, and he makes it through the gate. He comes in, and there's a lean-to with a two-by-four over the, in front of the stalls. And he runs in there, and Elvis saw it, and he oh, ducked boy. his head. And I tell you, he could have been killed with a broken neck. It could have been very bad. So nobody was anything except upset at what we were seeing. That horse came to a dead stop when he got in there. Elvis jumped off that horse. He was oh, I bet Boom! Hit that horse right in the jaw. The horse went in and everything, took a little step, and he said, no! And about that time, the wrangler come up, and Elvis didn't want him seeing. hit him, he's a good horse, he's a good horse. <laughs> Stroke in his forehead. Well, that wrangler comes up, and now he, he's upset. He's just white. He's scared because the picture hadn't even started, and Elvis could have gotten hurt badly, the movie put back for shooting, and he would never get another wrangling job. So he comes up, Mr. Preston, he jumps off, are you okay? He says, oh yeah, I'm okay, petting that horse. <laughs> he said, could I, could I have those reins? He takes the reins, he takes that horse, walks him out to the middle of the crowd. He gets up on top of him, and he spurs him good. And that horse lurches forward, and he jerks that rein. The horse stops. He did it again, several times. Horse starts frothing at the mouth here. He's getting hot. You know, he's upset. It's, he's being stressed out. All of a sudden, little speckles of blood appear. No, it's, it's his mouth. And he explained to us, he said, the horse hadn't been ridden for a while. He, his mouth hardened up. I had to tenderize it again. Mm. Well, boy, that guy could start to spur him. Even if that horse thought he was going to, he'd start and he'd go. But that horse just stopped. <laughs> That's all it was. So he 
When he had that done, he got off of him and said, Elvis, if you'll pick out another horse, we'll try this again. He said, no, I want him. He's a crazy son of a bitch. Try something again. That's what you used to do to him. <laughs> so that's the horse he rode, and he didn't, he didn't give him a problem the whole show, you know. You know, there was something else Elvis liked to do besides breaking horses, you know, uh, and that was play football. I'm just kidding about the breaking horses, <laughs> but that's what he just about had to do with that horse. But uh, and we there's a little park over there near where we lived at Bel Air now after we've been moved over. And uh, it was called Beverly Glen. It was right next to the, the estates there in Bel Air. And uh, we would go down there and play footballs on Saturday, and then we would watch, of course, the pro football games on Sunday. He was a big Johnny Unitas fan for the Colts and a big, big <coughs> Jim Brown fan of the Cleveland Browns. So we went down there, and the word got around, uh, not only just in the Hollywood scene, but other people started coming up there wanting to play. Cheerleaders started gathering up there, wanting to cheerlead. <laughs> but anyway, uh, some celebrities that came out, one of them was Michael Parks. And he, uh, he, was a long, he was in that series, Then Came Bronson. He did a lot of movies and stuff, too. You, you'd know if you saw him. But if you remember that series, he did that. And, and uh, another guy there that did a, a series, his name was, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about him, because he played football for UCLA. And that's a whole different story with Ricky Nelson and what he tried to pull. But uh, Pat Boone came up there once. <laughs> a little rough. Ty Harden from Bronco came up there, tough guy. He played ball in college and everything, too. So we had a lot of good times up there. Uh, Ricky Nelson heard about it. Well, Ricky idolized Elvis, but he also wanted to beat Elvis in football. So he goes to UCLA, and he's got some friends that play on the football team at UCLA that also worked on his series with his mom. Them, He actually played a college friend of, of Ricky's. He brings about five or six of them over there. And you know what? We held our own. We didn't do extra points. We just scored a touchdown and that was six points and we kicked or threw the ball to, to the other team. And they beat us 18 to 12. But I got to tell you something. There was a guy on that team called Kent McWhorter. He's about 6'2" about 240 pounds, and it was all muscle. Well, Alan Fortas, who worked for Elvis, had made All-State at Central High School there in Memphis when he played ball. He went, got a scholarship to Vanderbilt, and he went there, and then he dropped out after a year or two and, and quit playing. And I think he even dropped out of college. But he was a good little ball player, but he, he was short and stocky, and he wasn't very fast. So Kent was doing spin-offs of him and coming right on in and getting in the backfield every play. So Elvis said, Sonny, you and Alan switch places. I said, okay, I don't know what I'm in for now. And I'd go over there and I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm about 190 pounds at that time. So we line up and sure enough, boy, he comes exploding across that line and our shoulders hit and I thought a truck hit me. <laughs> so I kept him out a lot of the time and he got in sometimes. But when I went to shower, at the end of that game up at the house, I could barely lift my arm up to wash my face and my hair, shampoo it. And over the next two or three days, I couldn't. Had to shave with my left hand. This was just nothing but a big black and blue, hurting, painful hurt. And uh, so all that week, I'm just at the end of the week starting to get a little bit better. And I'm thinking, man, I hope they don't come back over there. I don't want a rematch. And they didn't come back. But I, I ran into Ken over the years. Uh, and in fact, we studied acting together at an acting class out in San Fernando Valley. And uh, I got to know him real good then. And he's only 180 pounds without the weightlifting. His normal weight was about 180. And you wouldn't know him as Kent McWhorter. You would know him as Kent McCord of One Adam 12. That, <clears throat> that was Kent. And uh, we became really good friends over the years. Uh, anyway, another story. Uh, Back then was uh, with, with uh, Vice President Agnew, and this took place like before, this was in the, the late 60s. 
he's down there staying at Frank Sinatra or someone, some celebrity's home. And he, uh, uh, Elvis finds out about it from some police people we knew down there. So Elvis wants to give him a gift. So we go over there. It's in a cul-de-sac, Secret Service out there, and we drive up. Elvis gets out, and he's got this box. It's a gun in there that he wants to present to Vice President Agnew. It's 357 Magnum with gold inlay in it, the ivory handle with black etching in it. It's just a beautiful gun. I think it cost him about $3,000 custom made. So the Secret Service takes it, takes it in. We go inside. We meet the Vice President. Nice man. We're talking and everything. And after a while, I said, Mr. Vice President, I, I wanted to give you a gift. And this is before the Nixon thing, okay? And he said, I wanted to give you a gift. And uh, so I brought it over. And he said, you're one of your Secret Service guys here that has it. So he brought it out. And he opened it up and showed it a beautiful gun. He said, oh, this is absolutely beautiful. He said, but I can't take this, Elvis, while I'm in office. And, uh, but I'd certainly like to have it when I, when I get out of office. And Elvis said, yes, sir, that's fine. I'll hold on to it for you. So went ahead and, and held on to it for him. And I don't know how long after that that Vice President Agnew had to resign from office. And we told Elvis, said, Elvis, you can give him that gun now. He's not in office. He said, no, he don't get the gun. He's a damn crook. He got caught. <laughs> so Agnew never got the gun, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, now, here's a favorite of Tim, my friend Tim Rochford. I got to tell this story. You don't know how much Elvis counted on us guys until you hear this story. It's regarding a taxi in Palm Springs, California. We get down there. Everyone goes to their room. We get up the next morning. There's about four or five of us. The other guys, they take off in one of the cars and they go shopping. I look and know that I've got to get some bacon and eggs, tomatoes and things like that, toast and things for Elvis's breakfast when he wakes up later in the afternoon. I don't know it. Elvis is already awake. None of us knew it, but he's already back there getting ready to come out. And that's unheard of. So I leave. I guess he walked out right after me, after I was gone. And he said he called out. Nobody answered. He went all through the rooms, rooms he's never even been in before. He didn't even know they were there uh, and uh, couldn't find anybody. So he decides to call a taxi because he wants to go shopping. So he picks up the phone. Well, Elvis never did this. He would just say, get Daddy on the phone, get Priscilla on the phone, get the Colonel on the phone, and we would dial it and give him the phone. He'd talk when he was done. He'd hang up. So he picked up the phone and dialed O, the operator. Told her he needed a taxi. She said, I don't do that, sir. He said, what do you do? She said, well, I help with with person-to-person calls and and collect calls and things like that, but you need to get a hold of information to to get the number for a taxi. He says, okay, how do I do that? She said, dial 411. He went ahead and said, okay, and he hung up and he dialed. She answers. He says, yes, ma'am, I need the number of a taxi. And she said, which one? He said, it doesn't matter, any one of them. She said, no, sir, which company? We've got several here. We've got Yellow Cab. Elvis knew that one. Everyone knows Yellow Cab. He said, that'll be fine. That's good. So she gave him the number. He calls the number. Dispatcher answers the phone. May I help you? Yes, I'd like to have a taxi cab come pick me up, please. All right, sir, what's that address? I don't know. He didn't know the address. I got to tell you, I didn't know the address. I knew where the house was, but I don't even remember the name of the street either. But she said, you want a cab and you don't even know the address? He said, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just down here visiting. I'm just leasing the home and everything, and, and I'm, I don't live here. And she said, well, what street is it on? He said, I don't know that either, ma'am. <laughs> she said, is this some kind of joke? He said, no, ma'am, it's not my name. I'm Elvis Presley. Oh, you are. <laughs> I'm Elvis Presley, and I, I just leased this house from Jack L. Warner. Well, everybody in Palm Springs knew who Jack L. Warner was. He owned Warner Brothers Studio. He was the head guy. Had a huge home down there. We weren't in, actually in his home. We were in his guest house, which was a four-bedroom with a pool and everything. And that was just the guest house on the estate. Wow. And uh, she said, well, 
oh, you're Elvis Presley and you're at the Jack L. Warner home. Well, I know where that is. And I'm going to send the cab over there. And Elvis Presley better come out and get in it. <laughs> he said, ma'am, why are you being that way? She said, I'm just kidding you, but I think you're kidding me. So anyway, I'm going to send the cab over there. So she did. Well, the cab driver gets over there, buzzes the intercom, because you have to have a key to get in or out. Or you can open it from inside in the box there when they buzz. You can talk to them and say, just a minute, or they can identify themselves, and then you hit a button and it opens. Elvis didn't know where this box was. He heard that cab driver's voice. <laughs> Taxi's here. Okay, I'll be right out. <laughs> Taxi's here. And he, he knew then the guy wasn't hearing him. He didn't know how to talk back to the guy. He said, I'm coming right out. Don't leave. <laughs> so he runs out there, and he goes up to the gate. Big seven and a half foot so gate, solid. Not one of the wrought irons you can see through. It's solid for privacy. And big stucco fence, about seven and a half feet can't see through he comes out there he can't open the gate he doesn't have a key there's no button there or anything to do and he said don't go man he said my name is Elvis and he said I know dispatcher told me it was Elvis Presley wanting the cab he said well I'll be there if I crawl over this thing just don't go and I pull up I see the cab driver there and I say uh, can I help you and he said, uh, well, not, maybe not me, but the guy on that fence said he's Elvis Presley on the other side. And he can't get his gate open. <laughs> I called out. I said, Elvis, Sonny, open this gate. <laughs> I went over and turned that key and that gate opened up. And he comes storming out of there. Where you been? I said, I went to get some food for you for breakfast. I thought you was asleep. Where's the rest of them? I said, they went shopping. Without me? I want to go shopping. I said, well, we'll go. Let me put the food up and everything and we'll go. He said, give that guy $100. <laughs> I walk over to that cab driver and I peel off a $100 bill and I give it to him. And he, oh, thanks, Elvis. You ever need me again, man? Just call me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that guy, no, five man. minutes, man, $100, you know? What a great but, story. Uh, that, that's, just, that's just a thing to show how much Elvis was protected, how much was done for him. And it just started and it just grew and grew. The bigger he got, the more things that he did, the less he did that we do every day just for, you know, just take for granted and everything. But I'd like to tell you some stories too. While we're up there in Bel Air, there's a story about a chimpanzee that Elvis got. Y'all have heard about it. His name was Scatter. And Elvis asked this guy that he got him from, why'd you name him that? He says, because when he gets mad, you better scatter. <laughs> very, they're very strong. They've been known to take cyclone fences and just pull them apart when they're mad. Just open them up. So we said, well, what makes him that way? He said, oh, you probably won't see him that way. He'll just bite you or something. <laughs> he had no fangs, but boy, he could sure pinch and draw blood with those teeth if he didn't like you doing what you were trying to make him to do. So kind of, Alan kind of got the responsibility for taking care of him, Alan Fortas. And Elvis had him dress him up because it, it was from a show. He was, he was a train chimp from a guy that was retiring and he was closing down his show and Elvis heard about it. And he bought the chimp from him. So he had Alan dress him up in his little yacht hat with his ascot and his little suit and everything in the pants, put him in the back of the limousine, and Alan get up there like a chauffeur and drive him around. And that champ's just sitting back there in that <laughs> car back there like he, I guess he did it all the time because he was trained for the show or whatever. But it was funny to watch, and I, I really think probably a lot of people back then thought that probably was Cheetah. Who was the, the, the chimpanzee for Superman? I mean, for Superman. For Tarzan, you know? Uh, because who else would be, what other chimp would be driving around like that, being chauffeur driven? But uh, then, but Scatter liked to drink. He'd go, if you set your drink down and he was out, he'd take off. He would, he'd just drink it down. And he'd get drunk and cause a problem. He went ahead and swung on a curtain and knocked a hole right through a big TV, I mean a big movie screen there in the room at Bellagio there where we watched movies. And he just knocked a hole right through it. And Elvis just died laughing. <laughs> you know, didn't bother him. And uh, one time he got loose there and he took all, he swung on the phone lines in the basement down there where his room was in his cage. And he tore all the phone wires loose. It took him three days to get them sorted. Which ones went to intercom, which ones for line one, which one was Elvis's private line. And it took him three days to sort it out because he just swung on them and ripped them right off the ceiling. <laughs> then he got out one time. And that was his downfall. 
He chased the next door neighbor's gardener into the pool. <laughs> Little Japanese guy, <laughs> screaming and yelling, took off, jumped into that pool, screaming and yelling. People come out of the house and they're scattered. <laughs> Doing this on the side of the pool, just warning that guy don't come out. Well, we got a letter from the Bel Air Homeowner Association, no exotic pets. So little scatter had to be shipped back to Graceland and Elvis had a beautiful custom made uh, place, temperature control, air conditioning, heat and everything, you know, for him. And, uh, but let me tell you what happened. Wasn't long, scatter died. He was young, uh. about six or seven years old. They lived to be 40 or 50. And he, uh, one day they went out to feed him, he was dead. And we found out that chimpanzees can actually will themselves to death. They give up. Aww. If they're lonely, they're like humans. They have to have comfort and they have to have, you know, communication with each other. And one by himself just gives up. And he did. He was so used to being drunk and crazy. And all of a sudden now he's just sitting out there and people come out and feed him. That's about it. That was really, we didn't go out there and visit with him that much. But, uh, it, uh, I always really love that chimp and everything, but there's, there's a lot of stories that, uh, that I, I, I wish I could recall all of them. I really do, so that I could tell you, because he was really upset when that chimp died. And then, it, and then it, again, it just, he was able to move on. He's able to, to get by it and move on. And when uh, that cage stayed there, Elvis never had it torn down, never put anything else in it, but he didn't have it torn down. I think a long time later that they might have, they might have removed that building. Vernon might have done it, because I, I can't remember in the latter years, but for years it just stayed out there. Hmm. Some of the guys thought that maybe one of the maids had poisoned him, because <laughs> he bit them too when they fed him. There was one daisy that just couldn't stand him. So... We thought it bad. We, we didn't think about that at the time. And later on, when someone said that they think she might have done it, it was too late to check him out and see what kind of toxic level he had of arsenic or something in him, you know. But uh, anyway, scatter was scatter. And Elvis had a lot of fun with him. I'd like to tell you all now a very moving story, one that still touches me today, almost like the one with my uncle and with Elvis, the first time I saw him like that. <clears throat> there was an appeal story written in the commercial appeal there, morning paper in Memphis. And it was an article regarding this little woman that had no legs from the hips down. She was born that way. She had had children, raised them. She would even raise, they had in the story, she had raised some of her grandchildren. And this appeal story was that she, how she got around on some wood that was nailed together and underneath they had these roller skates nailed to it. And they had these special handles with some like a leather thing. And she'd pull herself along like skiers do on snow skis and everything. And so Marty read it, Marty Lacker. And he brought it up to the house and I was sitting there with Elvis at the dining room table. And Marty said, Elvis, when you get a chance, I think you might want to read this. And I said, okay. He finished eating. And he picked over the paper and he looked at it. He looked up after he read it. He said, find out where she lives. So Marty did call the paper. Elvis went and bought the most expensive electric wheelchair made. And he and Priscilla, Marty, Alan, Richard, and I think Billy and myself went out there. And it was in the trunk of the car. We took it up to the house. Her husband, who was retired from the railroad, let us in. And he, uh, called her out. She came out, we heard her come around that corner. The house was spotless, boards bleached white, carpet, I mean the uh, linoleum in the kitchen just shiny and comes out and we heard her. She comes around that corner face to face with that wheelchair. 
Oh my, oh my. And tears started to come into her eyes. She knew what it was. And the tears came to our eyes. She asked if she could sit in it. We lifted her up, Elvis on the one side and I on the other, put her there and she's checking it out. And Elvis said, ma'am, now, I don't know how to tell you how to operate this thing, but he said, uh, they demonstrated over there and this year you can just go wherever you want to and get there fast and everything. So he said, we just want you to have it. She starts crying, we start crying and soon we're out of there. We have to, we have to get out of there. We walked outside and Alan said, Elvis, I don't think she knew who you were. He said, it doesn't matter. She knows someone cares. Oh, man. You know, uh, everyone knows through papers, articles, books, and everything about Elvis's generosity. It was almost to a fault. He just gave and gave and gave. He loved to give, and he loved the reaction that when you gave him after he gave you something, he didn't want you to fall all over him. He didn't want you to keep saying it. He didn't want you to come day after day. Oh, I can't believe. He didn't want to hear it. He didn't have time for that. So you thanked him and then you moved on. One night we were coming back. He was getting a custom made bus done by George Barris, who made all those monster cars and all those things for television, those shows. And he was doing Elvis's bus. And okay, so before Sonny gets into that, um, I just want to talk for a second about what Sonny was just talking about with uh, Elvis buying that wheelchair for that that poor woman that had no legs. I mean, that's just um, one example of many, many uh, compassionate and generous things that Elvis did. And it's, it's just, <clears throat> it's indicative of the kind of person that he was, uh, you know, whether he knew you or whether he didn't know you, if you were in trouble in any way, if you needed help in any way, Elvis always passed the blessing along and helped whenever and wherever he could. And uh, customizing it. So Elvis, Marty Lacker, Billy Smith, Elvis' cousin, myself, went out there to look at it one night. It was in May out in California, and we're driving Elvis's Rolls Royce limo. I'm driving. We get out there, see the bus, and we're talking about it, and George met us, and he's saying, this is coming along, it's starting to come together, and then we left, we came on back. It's a beautiful night. Clear stars are up there and everything, and Elvis, all of a sudden, while we're driving up through Bel Air, getting close to home, he says, you know what? This is baby blue convertible night. We said, yeah, it is, Elvis. He says, Sonny, turn this car around, let's go to that Cadillac place. I turned it around. We go over to a place called Hillcrest Cadillac over there on Wilshire Boulevard. I park the car. We go inside. Salesman in there. It's somewhere around 8 o'clock at night, I guess. And Elvis introduced himself as if he needed to, but it's just the way he was. Hi, I'm Elvis Presley. Hmm. And uh, he said, do you have a baby blue Cadillac convertible here? He said, no, sir, we don't. We don't, but I'll find you one. I'm sure there's a dealer somewhere around. He wasn't going to lose that sale, you know, if he could, if he, if he could help it. And I said, oh, okay. And so he said, okay. Well, as we had been riding over, Elvis often had said how much he loved the colors black and white for a car. That he'd usually rather have a black or a white car because you get tired of colors. When we walked in that showroom and I had talked to him, I said, Elvis, you sure you want blue? When we walked in there, it was a black Eldorado convertible right there on that showroom floor with the mahogany accent. It's a beautiful car. I said, Elvis, you sure, man, about that blue one? He said, man, that's pretty. Yeah, but I want that blue one. Mm -hmm. and we let it go. So when he said he could find one, he said, uh, Marty, you stay in here with him and see what y'all can find. Billy, he said, Sonny, let's go over across the street. So we went over across the street to the uh, used car lot part of Hillcrest. All kind of Cadillacs there, man. A few convertibles. We're walking through, no blue one. And I think that's what he's looking for. That if this guy can't find one, Elvis wants that blue convertible. Whether he gives it away the next day, he wants it that night. You know, that, <laughs> that's way he wanted things. So he said, There's not, I'm not, it's not here what I'm looking for. He said, where's that other Cadillac place? I said, well, further down Wilshire, there's a Lou Ehlers down near Fairfax or La Brea. 
He said, let's go. Billy, tell Mari we're going somewhere else. We'll be back in a few minutes. So we went down there, and I pulled in. I let Elvis and Billy out up there at the, at the door, and I, packed, I backed the Rolls Royce back over in, in the corner there and got it out of the way, and I got out, and I walked. And as I get to the door, Elvis and Billy and the salesman are coming out the door of the showroom. And uh, I stopped and everything, and, and Elvis said, like that one there, Sonny, like black on black. And I looked, and there's this beautiful 1963, a couple of years old, <clears throat> El Dorado convertible, black interior, leather. I said, there, Elvis, that's what you're talking about, man. That, that blue can't hold up to that. He said, well, maybe you're right. But he said, that's not my car. It's your car. Wow. Put the keys out. And I looked at him. I said, no, no, it's not either. No, it's not. I turned around. I walked away. I went back and got into the Rolls Royce. Got behind that driver's seat. Elvis comes over, gets into the passenger seat. Says, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing's wrong, Elvis. I, I, you don't need to buy a car for me, man. He just bought me a motorcycle a few months earlier. I drove his cars when I needed a car. I said, you know, Elvis, you always seem to be giving, and we always seem to be taken. And I don't, I don't want you to think you have to do that. He said, Sonny, you guys are giving when you don't know you're giving. I put a lot on you over the years, but you handle it. And this is just my way of showing you I appreciate that. And I said, well, it's nice, but just think that. If you think it, that's okay with me. I said, son, you can't tell me when you were a little boy that you didn't sit on that curb and watch Cadillacs go by and think one day. Because when you had a Cadillac back then, you had arrived. Man, you were it. And he said, and, and wish someday that you would have one. I said, well, Elvis, every, every kid does that. Everyone. He said, I know what, I did it. And he said, you know what? Here, you've got yours. Now let's go get mine. Wow. I hugged wow. him. I said, okay, let's go. So we left. He drove the Rolls Royce limo with Billy with him, and I put the top. Top wasn't down. I put that top down, <laughs> and we head back up to the other place. We get up there, and we walk in, and Elvis, walking in the salesman, Marty, Elvis, they found one over in Long Beach. They're going to service it, and, and they're going to bring it on over. I always looked at Selma and said, sir, would it be a problem to cancel that order and me take this one? Mm -hmm. He changed his mind. He wanted that black one. <laughs> and he said, no, sir. So he made the call and canceled. Never mind, he's going to buy one here. He's getting one here. So he said something about having it delivered. It'd be ready to pick up tomorrow. We can deliver it. I was, no, 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 I'm taking that tonight. He said, uh, Mr. President, he said, it, it had, it's got to be serviced. I said, it's got break-in oil in it. I know that. New cars have break-in oil that you get changed real quick after you buy the car. And he said, well, I, yeah, but I don't know if it's got gas. I said, give me the key. I, I knew Elvis wanted that car. I went over and I put that key in. I turned it and that needle moved just a hair. I said, it's got enough to get us to the gas station, Elvis. So we drove out of there with it. We pulled that right off the showroom. Elvis got it behind it. Billy got in with him, Marty got in the Rolls Royce driving, and I was in my car. We went up to the service station, gassed up, and went on up to the house. We picked up the rest of the guys. Elvis got Priscilla. He's got his top down, because it was on down, it was down when it was on the showroom floor, so. Uh, we're gonna go for a ride. So we come out of Bel Air, and we head down Sunset Boulevard going towards the beach. Well, as you get lower and lower towards the beach, it gets cooler and cooler. The guy in the back with me, in the back seat of my car, said, Sonny, man, put that top up. It's cold back here. I said, no way. No way that top, unless he puts his top up, this top stays down, guys. But I turned on the heater. And I put the side windows up. And they're huddled up, right up between the seats, just letting those heater blow on them, everything, and they huddle like this here. So we get down there a little bit, and I think Elvis feels it's a little bit cool too. And I don't know whether anyone complained or not, but all of a sudden he makes a U-turn on Pacific Coast Highway because we were headed towards Malibu. 
and he turns around, and as he turns, I watch him, and his side windows are up. <laughs> I don't know if he's got the heater on or not, but his side windows, so I make the turn, we get back up to the house, and everyone's talking about the car and everything, and then they'd go inside, but not me. I'm walking around, and I'm looking at that car. I just can't believe this is my car. It is absolutely beautiful. And uh, then I finally went in, and Elvis, uh, what do you think? I said, Elvis, I, I think I'm going to go back out there for a little while. You know? <laughs> said, no, no, it'll be there tomorrow. Come on, stay in here. <clears throat> Let's talk about it. Next day, he goes out and he starts buying more Cadillac convertibles for the rest of the guys. Wow. He bought a black one for red, just like mine, except it had red leather interior. And we're the only two that got the black ones. The rest of them had white and gold, and no, nobody got a blue one, though. He, wouldn't, he didn't buy anyone a baby blue one. But there was all different colors, two or three whites, a couple of golds, a light gray, and a maroon. And it took us about a week for, to find them, but he found them all, and I think it was something like eight or nine Cadillacs that he bought in a week's wow. time. And uh, it started looking like a caravan, you know, with all these different <laughs> colors and verbals driving around. Everybody wanted to take their car. We went, and I was, no, we ain't going to be taking the car. Get in our car. You know, we're not going to have eight, nine Cadillacs going down the road. So, uh, but that was... That was just his generosity, like the wheelchair in one way from his heart with, with the need that this woman had. And we didn't have a need, but he just wanted us to be happy and, and, and share in some of his wealth and what he had. And uh, that was his way of doing it. I used to joke about when I went to work for him, I was making $75 a week over at the appliance store. But when I went to work for him, my salary was $35 a week, over half cut. But let me tell you something. That 35 was like $1,000 a week. I drove Cadillac cars. I stayed in the best hotels. I ate the best food. My clothes were done. My dry cleaning was done. I had to do one thing. I had to pay for my cigarettes. They were 25 cents a pack. You know how many packs $35 will buy you a week? <laughs> but anyway, that, uh, that, that was part of it. Hey, guys. So thank you for watching this uh, video, Elvis up close and personal with Sonny West. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, part one of this two-part uh, video that I'm doing. Um, I just wanted to point out like a couple of favorite uh, parts of this video for me. Um, one being real funny and one being uh, really you know nice with the, or a real nice story. Uh, the funny part I like is um, when Elvis had to call the taxi. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, Sonny made a good point. You know, Elvis was, wasn't was used to doing things for himself. So, you know, nobody was home. So what, you know, so he didn't even know how to call for a taxi. That gives you an idea of just how, you know, much Elvis didn't do that, you know, you were, you and I would normally do, you know, like just calling up to order a pizza. Elvis didn't know how to do that, you know, because he paid people to do that for him. So that whole story, like um, every, you know, part of it to me, that was just so funny. The way Sonny said it, too, was really funny, man. Sonny is a really good storyteller. And uh, I enjoyed that one, uh, and I think you guys probably did too. That that was just that was just too funny. But um, <clears throat> the one that I really really liked was uh, that story with the lady that had no legs that went around with the little board with the wheels, and she rolled herself, and how Elvis uh, saw it in the newspaper <clears throat> and immediately went out. He told Marty Lacker, get her address and everything. Marty got it. And they, you know, they went out. They got her the, the best wheelchair that was out there. And they all, and Elvis brought it to her personally with the guys and everything. To me, that's just, I mean, that, that really, every time I hear that story, that, that moves me. It really, really does. Because, you know, you hear so many stories about Elvis's, uh, you know, compassion and just how he would help uh people he knew and people he didn't know you know and it was it was the truth you know it's it, something moved elvis uh 
to a point he, he would just act on it because he knew what it was like you know to have nothing he knew you know he he came from nothing really and he just he knew how the struggle was for for uh for people you know and and it, it was just like i said that was just one story of many stories of of his generosity and compassion you know i, I heard so many stories about it um but it's it's endless really but that one when i heard it when i heard sonny tell that story it just it moved me to pieces because you know i mean you're just picturing this whole thing going down in your mind and this woman not even expecting elvis presley to show up at her house with a wheelchair to to, to give to her i mean that's just you know i mean i you know you can go on forever about it, but it, to me, it's just that story never gets old. It's just amazing the kind of person that he was, you know, so. And uh, all right, guys. So like I said, uh, stay tuned for part two, <laughs> not four, two. <laughs> and um, I don't know when I'll have it up, maybe in another day or two. But as for now. Um, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it the same way I did. Um, thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you all so much for all your support. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, but I posted up a, a community post this week. Uh, this channel has reached over 4,000 subscribers in close to a year. And you know, I couldn't be prouder and I couldn't have, I couldn't be more grateful to you guys, honestly, for all you do to support me on this channel. It, it means more to me than you'll ever know. I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it blows my mind the point that this channel's gotten to within one year. It really has. And that's all thanks to you guys. So thank you so much, honestly. All right. So once again... Thanks for watching the video. Uh, thank you for subscribing. If you haven't, please do. And um, if you're not getting notifications about my videos, just go into your subscriptions. And next to my channel, there's a little bell. Just tap on that bell. You'll be notified every single time I put up a video. All right. So I hope all you guys are doing great. And as always, TCB and God bless. And stay tuned for part two for Elvis Up Close and Personal with Sonny West.